Hi, everybody. I think we're going to get started. Cool. Hi, everybody. Hi, Paul. Hi, Adam. So I'm here today to talk about Conflux. Um, my name is Ralph Bean. Yeah, exciting, exciting. Conflux is a new secure build system that we're working on at Red Hat for the building of our own products. And I was talking with people in the Fedora community. People were interested about considering its use in Fedora. And so my goal here today is just to talk about it on its own, teach you about it so you know some things about it to facilitate being able to have a dialogue and conversation longer term about if we want to do anything with it in the Fedora community. Uh, so first just, huh? And Matt says we do, Matt says we do. Um, Conflux is, is an opinionated, Kubernetes-native, security-first software factory. It's based on Tekton. Our goal is to be able to build software that's composed of multiple components. Um, if you sometimes look at like other things out there, like GitHub Actions, it's typically oriented on a single repo, but Conflux is oriented on building things from lots of repos, from lots of components coming together. Uh, we're aimed at providing transparency on the software supply chain, so when you build something, you know lots of things about what went into the production of that artifact, what happened to it along the way, and what are all the constituents that that made it up, that were available to it at build time. Um, we are, um, we have features that aim to help teams that are responsible for individual software artifacts input tests so they can make sure that the software they're making meets their own expectations, but then also provide ways for people who are not on that team to provide quality gates on the content that's being produced by that team. Our typical, like, like set of personas when we think about this are for like a release engineering department or a site rel reliability engineering department that wants to be sure that teams that are providing some software to them are meeting some criteria that they, they find necessary for deploying to their environments. Um, and I guess lastly, tying all that together with a unified user experience across the entire build, test, and release process. When I think about Fedora, I think this one's relevant to, to me. I spent some time working in Fedora infrastructure back in the day, and it was a whole bunch of different systems around that you had to have bookmarked to know how to hop between them. The systems inside Red Hat are similar in the way that they're disconnected, and if you know, then you know how to get around, but if you don't know, it's very hard. In Conflux, one of our goals is to make sure that there's a unified user experience, so for a particular change or a particular set of content, you can see all the way through the process where that content hasn't gone yet and where, where it's gone and, and, uh, and so on. Um, in talking to other groups about if they might want to consider adopting Conflux for usage in, in, uh, in their team, people fall into different categories. Fedora is not in the first couple of these. Um, today, Fedora uses Koji, which is also focused on supply, se supply chain security, right? It builds, builds in a very known and controlled way. You kind of can't tell Koji to do a build that is going to produce a build that's not acceptable to uh, its use in, in Fedora. Um, some people uh, don't have a secure build system at all, and so they might consider using Conflux. Others, um, you know, know that they have problems with the su supply chain security of their artifacts, but they don't have time to invest in making that happen. So looking at Conflux is something you can take off the shelf to get uh, uh, the, the, the benefits of a secure, secure build system. Um, worrying about the provenance of your software builds is something that's more and more in the uh, in, in discussion recently. And, you know, I feel like I need to, to skip through this. The most important point for Fedora is thinking about inflexibility uh, and uh, having difficulty in changing the system. Making changes to the way things are built um, in Koji, I think, is a relatively difficult process. But in Conflux, we put um, a premium on trying to make it easy to modify the way that things are built while still putting guardrails in place to make sure that things that are done unacceptably can't get released um, out of that system. Builds produced by Conflux, um, we, we have a, a, a special focus on our, our um, uh, production of SBOMs and the system. SBOMs are software bill of materials, or source bill of materials for an artifact. When we're doing a build in Conflux, we do it with no network available, so we can be sure that nothing that happens during the build is reaching out to the network and grabbing things that weren't declared up front to be a part of the build. Uh, so that afterwards, when we have an artifact and we want to um, assess is there a vulnerability in some dependency that was available at, at some time in the past? Is that included in any of the artifacts that came out of our system? Um, we don't just rely on developers to declare those up front, but because we control what actually happens in the build process itself, we can be sure that the software bill of materials that we have is, is accurate. Some of the other tools that are, are out there that aren't used in Fedora today are things like SIFT. SIFT is a popular tool for generating SBOMs. SIFT is limited in what it can do because it's essentially statically analyzing a Git repository or some binary artifact. 
So if it can find like per Python a requirements.txt file, it'll say, well, I know what all the, build, the artifacts are that's gonna go into this build. But of course, if something then happens in setup.py, that's curling some art, art, artifact from some other place, Sift has no idea that that's happening and can't have any idea that that's happening. You have to control what's happening at build time um, in order to be sure what's, of what, what went into your builds in the past. Uh, I think a, a second important part about um, Conflux is that w w because we're using Tekton, we get, uh, get to take advantage of the system called chains, Tekton chains. Um, as builds are unfolding in Conflux, chains is watching from the side and generating an immutable log of everything that's happened called, uh, called an attestation. It will cryptographically sign that and it will push it to the same destination as the artifact gets pushed out of the build process. What's really nice about this is that wherever the artifact gets copied after the fact, the attestation, that immutable log, goes with it. And so when you're inspecting the artifact, you can inspect, you don't have to just query back to some static build system to ask questions about this artifact and what happened to it. You can look at metadata that's traveling with the artifact itself. Um, yeah. I, I, think, I think this is maybe some of the more interesting stuff for, for Conflux, understanding its architecture and what it looks like, right? Like the systems that make up the build uh, and release system in Fedora today, Diskit with Pagger, um, uh, uh, Koji and Bodhi uh, form this set of systems that work together with other, other systems. Um, each exposes their own API server, right? And again, like I was talking before, you have this, uh, exp this problem as a, as a user where you have to know what all those things are in the first place. Once you learn, then you know. But um, for, um, for the development and maintenance of those systems themselves, each gets its own bespoke implementation of some REST API. It's performing its own authentication and authorization checks. Um, we have to uh, take care that each of those API servers are deployed. Do they work consistently? If we want to have a change across all of them, anyway, that's, that's, that's all difficulty. With Conflux, we have a single API server. It's the Kubernetes API server, OpenShift in our case, when we're running it in our, for our production use. Um, so that means that our services no longer look like those REST services, those HTTP-based REST services, but instead our controllers that are running as a part of Kubernetes, as part of, um, uh, as a part of Kubernetes, and are responding to requests input by users as these custom resources in the, in the cluster. Um, we are using Tekton, like I said. Um, so that w what that, I think, gives us here is extensibility for the user. Part of the experience when you first um, are using Conflux and you come to enroll a new repository that you want to be built in the system, one of the first things that will happen is it will send a merge request to your repo or a pull request to your repo with the definition of the pipeline that it would use to build uh, your artifact. Uh, and what this gives you then is the opportunity to change that definition, right? If you, have, if you want to extend it to do something else, if you want to send a, a notification to Matrix at the completion of your build, you're able to add that into the pipeline of your artifact to send it to a particular place. Um, the same goes for testing and for releasing. We're using Tekton for orchestration of all those steps um, at each part in the process. Another detail, that I think this is, a, this is an architectural constraint of the design of Conflux, is that the user has admin in their own workspace, which means in the first place, remember I mentioned that we send this merge request with the definition of the pipeline. Uh, a user can change that and therefore change the way that their, art, their, uh, their artifact is built. Uh, in the workspace where that Tekton pipeline will run, the user has elevated permissions in the first place. And so what this means is we can't design any approaches that are going to require providing system level secrets uh, to that workspace because the user can, can access that. They can do something, uh, something untoward with that secret. Uh, and so anything that the system does that involves secrets need to be scoped. Um, for the pushing of an artifact after the build, there's no global push secret that's available to all workspaces. Instead, one is provisioned that is given only permissions to push to repositories that are associated with that particular artifact. Uh, in terms of storage, artifacts for us are OCR, or OCI artifacts. So we're storing everything in Quay.io for the production deployments that we maintain, but any OCI registry should, uh, should work. Uh, and that goes for the artifacts themselves as well as the SBOMs. I mentioned the attestations. Uh, and, and signatures are all OCI artifacts that we push uh, uh, next, to the, next to the artifact there. Um, artifacts need to be provably trusted. I, I mentioned a couple slot, um, points ago about the degree to which a user can change things. They can change their build pipeline. They have admin access in their own workspace. And so at the end of the day, we still need to be able to trust the artifact when we're going to release it somewhere meets the kind of criteria that are required by that release destination. Imagine Fedora release engineering in this, in this case. Um, and 
the attestation object that comes along, we have to take care in the way we write these machine readable policies that allow, would allow release engineering to gate those artifacts and say these can't be released, to only rely on attributes of the attestation that we can be sure weren't able to be influenced by the user so that we can say, okay, this must be built by this set of trusted tasks. There cannot be another task that ran at the same time that had access to a pers persistent volume claim that the build process also had access to, because if it did, then this other task may be meddled with something or injected something into the build that we wouldn't otherwise know about. Um, that's all to say that we, we, there's a lot of machinery that's gone into that, that um, um, machine-readable policy mechanism to be sure that the things that we're checking are provably trusted um, all the way back to that controller chains, which is watching independently and uh, generating statements about what happened at build time. Um, our, on our APIs, there's three slides here, one on build, test, and release. Right? These are like the three large domains of what happens as software is moving through Conflux. Uh, and then this is broken into, uh, vertically into three different sections, control plane resources, data plane resources, and controllers. Um, for us, con these, again, I mentioned our API is the Kubernetes API server, so everything here is a custom resource in Kubernetes. If you've ever used Kubernetes before and you're going to get pods or get cron jobs, you're getting these nouns, right? Um, pods, cron jobs. Um, we've extended Kubernetes to add our own control plane resources and data plane resources that represent things that the user wants to instruct the system to do. So for uh, control plane resources here, application and component, um, component defines uh, is the way that the user instructs the system to say, here's a Git repository that I have that I would like you to build from a particular branch. An application is just a grouping of components that should be tested and released together. Um, and we're, we're entirely um, Git driven, so as k commits land in a Git repo that's registered with a component in some workspace, then the, um, a webhook will fire from that Git forge uh, and uh, induce the creation of a pipeline run, a build, um, which uh, accumulate in the user's workspace uh, and which we garbage collect and move off to a, a Postgres database after they complete. Um, at test time, we have uh, another resource integration test scenario, which is how the user registers uh, a, a test that they'd like the system to run when builds complete. Um, the integration service at the bottom is the controller responsible for, for managing that. It's watching for when pipeline runs complete, when builds complete, and when they do, then it'll look and see, oh, do I have any integration test scenarios defined for this particular combination? If I do, then generate a pipeline run to test that. We have maybe an important resource here is this snapshot resource. For us, it represents an immutable set of builds uh, that are going to undergo testing and later can undergo releases. And unlike like floating tags in a registry, you know, if you're referring to the floating tag of some container image and you're checking it one day, it might change and now it's referring to another digest another day. The snapshot for us is digest pinned and is unchangeable on clusters. So if you want to know if a particular set of content passed testing or not, you're asking about did the snapshot ID um, for that particular content undergo testing and did it pass uh, or not. And you know kind of unambiguously that you're, you're talking about the same, um, the same set of content. Uh, and lastly here at release time, we've got this uh, notion of, of uh, origin namespaces and target namespaces, dev namespaces, and sometimes we call them managed namespaces, meaning they're managed by another team. Um, there's two reciprocal resources here, the release plan and the release plan admission. If, you're, uh, if you have a workspace in a Conflux instance and you're building some content, then uh, you establish, a you put a release plan in place that says, I'd like to release this content to some destination. You can, if you ignore the release plan admission side of the house for, for a moment, on that release plan, you can specify a tecton pipeline that would carry out the steps of your release. And then at any point, you have some content. Like imagine the previous slides, you, you had successful builds. You have a snapshot that passed testing. You create a release resource, which is an instruction to the system to execute some pipeline defined on your release plan, and it'll do so in your own workspace and release that content wherever, assuming you have rights to that, con that destination, wherever that is. Um, for use in like a larger um, organization, like, like Fedora or inside Red Hat for Red Hat teams, uh, we have this division between dev namespaces and target namespaces where you might want to be releasing your content into the custody of another team, a site reliability engineering team, or to a release engineering team, um, and they want to control some details about the way you're publishing that. They can encode that particular set of, of controls and constraints on the release plan admission, um, and furthermore, execute the release pipeline in a namespace that's not the namespace you yourself have access to, so that that can run with access to secrets to publish content to places that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. And that gets us to the end of that. I wanted to 
uh, guide people to this. I think maybe this is the more interesting thing. In, in the run-up to Flock, we tried to set up, or we, we did, we set up a, thank you. We set up an instance of Conflux um, that is public that you can authenticate to with FAS. So if you access this link, it'll take you to, uh, I'm gonna leave it up for a second in case people wanna grab it, although I don't see people jumping on it, so maybe I'll just switch to it. My goal here, I would love for, for people to try Conflux, right? Like, I mean, I, how can you talk about it? I tried to give this, this high-level overview of what we do in terms of supply chain security, why you might think that the builds are trustable or not, how you can you know, organize these high-level resources to construct the building of anything. But if you think about the application of Conflux to Fedora, it's like a very specific set of problems and challenges around how you build and manage the, the distribution. And Conflux is not like natively attuned to doing that, right? It wasn't like built for Fedora's purpose. And so we would need to make lots of decisions about how we want to do that in Conflux. And the only way to do that is for people to mess with it, play with it, learn a little bit about it, and then we can have discussions ongoing over time about how, how do we want to organize the management and building of the distribution in Conflux, again, if that's the thing that we want to do, um, which Matt's, Matt said we do. Oh. Yeah. So I, I, maybe people have grabbed the link. Um, I'll jump. Over. Um, this is a gist, just with details about the, the, the instance. Um, I'll start, I guess, with some caveats. We have support for multi-arch builds in general. However, the, the public instance for Fedora only has uh, x86 and ARM at the moment. Uh, we just didn't have time to set up power and S390 before Flock, but it's a thing that hopefully we'll be able to complete, I don't know, in the coming, coming weeks. Uh, it's a matter of IBM Cloud accounts um, getting organized to, to make it happen. Uh, the onboarding process, like if you go in and you enroll any Git repository and say, I want to build this, it is going to assume that you're building a container because the system still is biased towards containers and operators. And so it's going to send you a build uh, pipeline definition if you're trying to build something else, like say an RPM, and it just won't work. It's going to say, I can't find a container file here. I can't, I can't build this. Um, but a little bit for, so just know that first of all, try to build containers to get a, 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 an understanding of that. But know that here further down, um, I've got under some examples. There's an example of an RPM being built in Conflux using some, that, taking advantage of those um, uh, patterns I was talking about before where you know, the, the, the build definition pipeline is sent to your repo, but then you have the power to change it. And that gives the power to experiment uh, in, in the production environment, but without having to set up a whole instance yourself to manage and maintain. Um, so. uh, back up on, on caveats. Uh, there's a user access section of the UI, which I really wish was working for Flock, because one of the best parts about learning about a system is being able to share what you've done with other people. If you each go and log in, you'll each get your own workspace associated with your FAS identity. Um, and like if Matt goes and does something cool, I would love for Matt to be able to invite me, Ralph, to his workspace so I can see and comment on it and tell him about it. But right now that is broken. So if you have a workspace and you want to share it with others, just come see me privately and I can do magic on the administration side to get you access between workspaces. We hopefully will fix that soon in the UI in this instance so you can share with one another. So just understand that's a, it's a limitation. Can workspaces be visible to uh, the public? I, at the moment, no, um, but why not? Uh, it's a matter, it's, at the end of the day, our, our API server is just the Kubernetes API server. And so it's all just about role bindings. And there's a role binding that we could put in place for the system, I think it's system authenticated group? Mm, no, this is, this is not the answer to your question. That would give access to anybody who's authenticated with FAST in the first place. But you were asking, can it be open to anybody for unauthenticated yeah, view and access? And look and see and yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't know. We have to see if, with Kubernetes role bindings, if we can do something for an, 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 an unauthenticated group. But I think that might not, not be a thing. We'll see. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I was looking over at the RPM example that you have there. And I, with the caveat that I don't know anything about any of this. Sure. Um, it, my impression from like skimming through it, it seems like a fairly low level thing in that it looks like the, the pipelines that are defined there involve kind of the minutiae of the various steps of building an RPM that I'm fairly sure we probably don't want packagers to have to think about in like 95% of cases. Right. Uh, are there like, higher level abstractions that we can build potentially with the system to make these? Yes, there are. So the, what you're looking in there in the, is in the doc, for everyone else, so 
maybe I should repeat the question. The, the, Please. Yes, I'll try. He was looking at the RPM example, and as he was reviewing it, he said it seemed it looked like a really a whole bunch of low-level details for the individual instructions for how you build an RPM. And I nodded, yes, that's that's right. That is very 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 low level. So you were looking in the dot tecton directory, and there's a bunch of pipeline definitions there, and they all have their tasks. So there's a pipeline. The pipeline's composed of tasks, and the tasks have what you would call an inline task spec. So the full definition of the task is just there in place, and you're seeing all those low-level details. But we would replace that with a task ref, a reference to a task, which is maintained somewhere else. What you're seeing is the product of experimentation and a POC. As a you, as a user, could you know fork my repo, I don't know, and start changing those and building your RPM very differently. And we share it with each other and say, ah, my way's better, and then we agree. The way we, we move eventually is that in Conflux upstream, we maintain a Git repo called build definitions, and all of our canonical pipelines and tasks are there, and the, the, the instances of Conflux will trust those tasks in the first place. Uh, we would want to, like these tasks, if we tried to run them through the release service in that instance of Conflux, would reject them and say these, oh, these, these, these there you go, yeah. <laughs> this this <laughs> artifact was built in Conflux, I can verify that, but it was built, I don't know, in some way. So, um, okay. In the back, yes. Do you want to run me a mic or any question? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. There we go. Uh, hey, Ralph. Uh, Adam Williamson, Fedora QA. So obviously my thoughts go straight to testing. How does testing work in the design? Is it all kind of inside Conflux, or does it farm it out to something like Testing Farm? How is that set up? Yeah, the, the, that integration test scenario resource, uh, with it you specify a Tecton pipeline that runs in cluster, in Conflux, in your workspace. But within that pipeline, you could call out to any other system if that's what you wanted to do. Uh, Thank you. Actually, can I just follow up on that question with one more? Because you, oh, yeah. uh, you previously said that Conflux, uh, everything it does is uh, network isolated. Uh, does that mean that it wouldn't be able to uh, call out to an external testing service? Ah, it's not that everything that it does is network isolated. It's that particular tasks are run with network isolation. So in the example where we had low-level build details, if you can change that and then therefore run your build without network isolation. But again, when it comes to release time, it would, the system would recognize that was built in some way that did not have those properties. Uh, a couple hands. How about in the back? Hello, thanks. Very interesting presentation. Uh, what about signing? How do you plan to, to do the signing of artifacts, especially in the view of RPM repository? And yeah. like There's lots of problems to solve for RPMs. <laughs> How about that? For, uh, it's for just computer? because in Kojit, well, always something that people have different solutions, different way of doing it. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering if it's a good idea to think early in signing because it's a hard problem to solve, especially if you don't necessarily have, open, have access to everything. Definitely. It's, we were talking about it over lunch, I guess is all I can say, but I, I don't think it's, we know exactly how it's going to work, but we're thinking about it. Cool. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned that the software is structured to protect itself to, from the user, from, from interference by the user, so that the attestations and stuff cannot be really interfered with. Uh, can you give an idea of how that works in case, uh, as you said, the, the user also has admin powers? So is there anything stopping the user from interfering with the Conflux software itself, like logging in, breaking the software, and then breaking the attestation that way? It's a great question. So the, um, the, the, all the builds are running in the user's workspace. Um, call it, I'm Ralph, call it Ralph's workspace. But the system that's generating the attestations is running in a different namespace, the, uh, the Tecton namespace, and it has access to a key to a secret that I don't have access to. It's observing my pipeline runs, unfolding and generating statements about those. So I can change my build to do different unsafe things, but when I do that, I cannot influence the recording of that by that system. I, I could, here, here's, an, here's a, an attempt at an attack. Because I have access to my namespace, I can steal the secret that the system would use to push my artifact to its destination location. And if I would do that, then if something was trying to validate the artifact at the end of the day, it would look at the attestation generated and see that the digest doesn't match the thing that was originally pushed by the system with this thing that I've tried to replace it with. Well, let's say that I go a step further and I try to generate my own attestation as if I were that chains system, which I can do using command line tools and push them into the repo. When I try and do that, it would say, ah, well, the attestation matches the artifact, but the attestation is not signed with the key that I trust as the release system, and so I'm going to reject this whole thing. And that's some of the ways that we get certainty about what's happened. Any other hands? 
see Kevin. Yeah, just real quick, uh, are flat packs at all on your They radar? They are. Yeah, we can build them now. Oh, very good. Yeah. And uh, second, somewhat trivial question, why Conflux? Why, why the name? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a uh, Conflux uh, with a C, not with a K, is where uh, two bodies of water come together and meet. And so in some ways, we're the combining of multiple open source projects to make Conflux itself. Also, something that you might build in Conflux would be multiple artifacts coming together to make a composite whole. And then K for Kubernetes. Hi, thank you. I see one last question, then I think we may be out of time, true? Uh, yeah. So I asked Matthew this, and he, asked, he told me to ask you. Yeah. Uh, so in, in Fedora, we have a pretty granular um, permission and ownership model for packages. So packagers can have different levels of access for the different packages. There are packages that they maintain directly themselves. There are packages that they can commit to, but they won't necessarily issue bills for. There are packages that they can issue bills for as part of like larger membership of a group. Like I'm part of the Rust SIG. I can do builds for all the Rust packages, but I'm not necessarily the primary maintainer for those packages. Mm -hmm. uh, how do these like and like matrix style maintenance model translate here? Because the way I understand it here, everybody does builds kind of themselves, and then is the promotion step where the access control would be. Like, are we able to express this kind of complexity in this model? Mm -hmm. And how would that map? I think you can. There's some choices to make that haven't been made yet. And one is the shape of the, the namespace or the workspace. Are we going to have one giant big namespace for all of Fedora that everybody contributes to? Or are we going to have different like namespaces spaces for the different SIGs, for different like language ecosystem teams? We could impose some structure if that was a choice we wanted to make. Okay. In terms of granular access, I think it's there. It's, I haven't actually checked to see if the FAST group is coming through on the OpenIDC JWT token, but assuming that it is, then we can use regular Kubernetes RBAC to grant, let's say, uh, maintainer access versus admin access in this namespace or that main namespace, depending on which FAST group you're in. Oh, okay. And that's the way you... Yeah, if, if you can populate down the FAST groups, I think that would address. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you'll be able to sanely break this down hierarchically because it's very common to have like shared like maybe you I mean, can do it by language but it's still iffy even in that yeah. case and just to be clear i don't think it would really be hierarchical it would be flat but it could be segmented if we wanted to got it so, yeah. there's another hand up but i think we're out of time we should end yeah sorry oh we can meet afterwards yeah thank you <laughs>